sizes. Some elements are bigger than others. Some elements are smaller than others, too. And we learned all about atomic radius and all that jazz. It's kind of interesting, right? You know, if you're thinking about that, the atoms have different um, sizes. I personally, when I was a student, I thought they were all the same size. And I thought that size was small. It was all really small. There we go. Excellent. Now, in terms of atomic size, you know that as we go from left to right on the old periodic table, they tend to get smaller. As we go top to bottom, they tend to get larger. So now, if we want to talk about an atom's ability to attract electrons to itself, then we have to think about something called electronegativity. So, not all atoms are equal. Some atoms can attract electrons better than others. And that should make sense, right? We all know that fluorine, for example, chlorine, bromine, iodine, they all want to get one electron, right? And things like sodium, lithium, potassium, rubidium, they all want to dump one off, right? So you know that fluorine, chlorine, bromine are better at stealing electrons. They're just better at it, right? They have a really high affinity for it. They can steal them. Sodium, lithium, potassium, those ones, they don't really like to steal. They like to give. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So their affinity for electrons is probably pretty poor. Make sense? Also, lithium, compared to say chlorine, is large. So size plays a role. The smaller you are in general, the more you can attract electrons to yourself. Does that make sense? Because the closer you are to your protons, right? Make sense? A little bit? All right. And that's measured with this term called electronegativity, which is basically your ability to draw electrons to yourself. Okay? That's all it really is. Your ability to draw electrons to yourself. And up here is obviously a better written note definition. As you go from left to right on the old periodic table, the electronegativity will increase. As you go top to bottom, electronegativity tends to decrease. So that means fluorine is actually the most electronegative atom. As you go far left to here, and the top is here. These ones we don't even consider with electronegativity because they don't usually react. Fluorine's the top dog. It's the smallest element, or one of the smaller elements. And it's very electronegative. It can seriously draw electron density to itself. Pretty neat, huh? Size matters. Okay. Metals tend to have very low electronegativities because they want to adopt plus charge. So they want to dump electrons off. So they're not really in the business of attracting them. But they can. They do have measurable electronegativity. Okay. Now, is that so far pretty clear? Not too bad? Well, you said, can you repeat your definition of your ability to attract electrons to yourself. That's basically what it means. Don't write this down. Don't try to memorize it. I'll give this to you on your exam. This is a table of electronegativities. Now you can see fluorine being our top dog has electronegativity of 4. So the scale actually runs from 0 to 4. So having an electronegativity of 4, that's a big deal. You're the most electronegative atom. Having an electronegativity of 0.7, for example, that's pretty low. Because it's only out of, out of uh, four points, or, or five points, remember? Zero to, five, zero to four. So that's pretty low. Notice, oxygen, 3.5. That's still pretty darn electronegative. Because remember, the scale is only at a four. So 3.5 is, whew, man, you're pretty good. Carbon, 2.5. Hydrogen, 2.1. So they all have numbers associated with their ability to attract electrons to themselves. All right. Now, let's take a look at things called polar versus non-polar. Okay, now the word polar, the word polar, well, where have we heard that word before? Well, North Pole, right, where Santa Claus lives? Yes. The South Pole, where the penguins live. Pole, polar means to have poles. What does it mean to have poles? Well, in the Earth, we have a North and a South Pole, right? Magnets are also polar. They have a North and a South Pole. Does that make sense? You could think of that, we don't, but you could think of it as positive and negative. Why? Well, take two magnets, put the North Poles together, what happens? They repel. 
they push back. Put the uh, south and the north pole together, they slam together, they attract, right? Just like positive and negative, right? Take two positive things, put them together, they will repel, right? Two negative things together, they repel, just like a magnet. Same idea. So to be polar in chemistry means you have one part of your molecule has a slight, has a positive charge, the other side has a negative charge. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you have poles, plus minus. This is like a battery, right? Grab your AAA battery or AA or whatever. Look at one side has a little nubby, the other side's kind of flat, plus and minus, right? Batteries have poles. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Molecules do too. Nonpolar. What does it mean to be nonpolar? That means you don't have poles. You don't have a positive side and a negative side. You're just kind of neutral. Nothing's going on. All right? Now, in terms of atoms or bonds, let's take a look. Let's bond hydrogen to hydrogen. And let's bond hydrogen to something electronegative like uh, yeah, fluorine. Why not? Hydrogen to hydrogen. Hydrogen to fluorine. Now, hydrogen, I'm just going to flip back in the table here. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. I can read it right off the old table, which I will, I will provide this exact table, this one right here from your book. I'll give it to you on your exam. So don't try to memorize. So now, hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. So let's write that down right here. Electronegativity 2.1. This hydrogen has electronegativity of 2.1. Now, if you look at that and you say, okay, I have a covalent bond, a hydrogen bond to a hydrogen. They're going to hold on to each other in a covalent fashion, right? Everyone pick a partner. Pick a partner. What? Everybody, do it. Find someone that you can hold hands with. Well, you can hold arms with hands. Go ahead, seriously, do this. Now, your hands are your electrons. So your hand is your electron, your partner's hand is their electron. You don't have a friend. <laughs> Hold your own hand. You now, imagine that you and your friend are equal in strength. So if you were to pull hands, your hands would more or less stay in the center, wouldn't they? So you're both hydrogen, let's say. Electronegativity is 2.1. You're both trying to steal each other's hand. Don't really don't try to hurt each other. You know what I mean? Okay? So you're pulling and they're pulling with equal strength. So your hands are going to stay relatively in the same place. They're not going to go one side or the other, are they? Okay. Now let's imagine one of you is fluorine. Now you guys pick who's fluorine. Fluorine is stronger. It can draw electrons into itself better than hydrogen can. Is that correct? So pick someone to be fluorine and pull the electrons closer to that one part. Don't hurt each other. Don't hurt each other. Be nice to each other. Now, who's got the, more of the electrons? Who are they closer to? Fluorine. fluorine. So in terms of fluorine, fluorine has your electron, the, the hydrogen's electron, a little more often. Is that true? It's closer, isn't it? Yeah. Hydrogen, the other partner, it's got the short end of the stick. They're losing that electron. They're holding on for dear life, but it's just, it's start, oh, come back. It's like when your girlfriend leaves you, right? <laughs> or your boyfriend leaves you, either way, right? So now, go ahead and let go of each other's hands. <laughs> so now, when you're both hydrogen, the electrons stay relatively in the center. Neither one of you had it more often than the other. Is that correct? So neither one of you had any kind of charge. You were both kind of the same, just kind of neutral. Does that make sense? When one of you was fluorine, one of you had an electronegativity of 4.0, the other partner had 2.1. So 4.0 to 2.1, that's a lot. That's a big difference. Fluorine is going to draw that electron over to it, just like your partner did. They pulled the electron towards themselves. So they, in essence, have the electron more often than you do. They're attempting to steal it. But they can't because you're too strong. Make sense? Make sense? Yes. You're too good at preventing theft. So you will not be stolen from. Make sense? <laughs> so now, by virtue of the fact that this fluorine has the electron a little more often, it's not neutral. Right? Because you have the electron closer to you, right? 
So you weren't actually neutral. You had a slight negative charge. Not a pure big negative, because the hydrogen is not letting go, but you're slightly negative, because you have the electrons closer to you. Does that make a little bit of sense? How do we indicate that? We have this thing called delta, Greek letter delta. What is delta? Delta means partial or slight in chemistry, partial negative, slight negative. We'll call it delta negative. The fluorine here is somewhat negatively charged. Make sense? Everybody good yes. with that? Yeah. So the hydrogen, therefore, must be somewhat positive. Right? Yes. Because it's getting its electrons stolen from it. It's somewhat positive. Okay? Is that reasonable? Delta negative. The fluorine, because it's more electronegative, pulls the electron towards itself. Hydrogen, because it's losing some electrons, becomes slightly positive. It's not letting go. It does not let go. But it's being stolen from. It's like just, ah, oh, can't keep it. It's going away. Right? Now, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Okay. Now let's pick one that we know will be ionic. How about sodium and chlorine? Sodium and chlorine. That's also a polar. That's also a polar molecule. But we know that the sodium is positive and the chlorine is negative. Okay, sodium's positive, chlorine's negative. That's a pure outright theft right there, but that's considered polar, because you have a plus side and a minus side. Make sense? Everybody kind of clear on that? Not too shabby, right? Not too hard? Okay. Write this down for me. Non-polar covalent bond. Now, this is only for covalence. Uh, we're gonna talk for a while. Ionic compounds are always polar, but let's talk now about covalent. You get non-metals together, those form covalent bonds, you already knew that. If there is an equal or almost equal sharing of electrons, so hydrogen, hydrogen to hydrogen, they're the same, so neither hydrogen can pull the electrons more one way than the other. Make sense? So they're going to be non-polar covalent. The bond is covalent and it is non-polar. Therefore, the electrons will sit kind of in the center of the bond. No atom has it any more than the other. Okay. So now, if you have an electronegativity difference of 0.4 or less, you are considered non-polar. Pretty cool, huh? Non-polar. So now, if you die, say we have... Well, the example they gave us chlorine and bromine, let's do that one. Say we have a bond between chlorine and bromine. Those are the two atoms we're going to consider. We have that bond, and we want to know if that bond is polar up, is polar or nonpolar. We already know it's covalent. Two nonmetals bond, two nonmetals bonded together. That's all day long. Excuse me, covalent. We need to know if it's polar or non-polar. What do we do? We go to our chart that I will give you on your exam. We look up in the back of that chart and we say, okay, what's the electronegativity of chlorine? And we find out chlorine is 3.0. It's on the chart, it'll be given to you on the exam. Don't memorize these values. We look up bromine. Bromine is 2.8, 2.8. And we do the subtraction. So 3.0 minus 2.8 is 0 0.2. That's the difference in electronegativity. Okay? That's the difference. So therefore, that difference is less than 0.4. So that bond is considered to be nonpolar. The electrons are more or less being shared equally by both. They're, neither one is really good at stealing from the other. So that's the difference, uh, 0.4 or less. It's considered to be non-polar. So there is no delta negative or delta minus here. There isn't a delta negative or delta minus. Make some sense? Everybody kind of okay with that? Why isn't there, okay. like why isn't there a delta I'm confused with? Because there's less than a 0.4 difference. 
Okay. The difference means subtraction. So we subtract the electronegativity of one from the other, and the difference was less than 0.4. So the difference was only 0.2. So it always has to be less than 0.4. If it's non-polar covalent, uh, yeah. If it's polar covalent, which we'll get to in a minute, it'll be polar. But if it's, different, if it's less than 0.4, it will be non-polar. Make sense? Okay. So they're close enough to where... They're they close enough to the same that neither one really steals from the other. Okay. Can, neither one can attract it that much more than the other. Okay. They consider that to be an insignificant difference. Okay. It's like being bipolar. Like, good if you're good <laughs> chemicals and your bad chemicals are balanced, you're not bipolar. But if you're... True. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. That's, that's a good one, yeah. Remember, I, I, I guess I probably couldn't say that because then I might be insulting someone, but students can say it all the time. <laughs> good. That's, that's a great analogy. Say it louder so everyone can hear you. I, I never said this. <laughs> oh. You for real? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's like being bipolar. When your good chemical and your bad chemicals are equal, you're not bipolar. But when your bad chemical are higher than your good chemical, then you're bipolar. Do you get it? No, when you're polar, when you're not bipolar, you're not polar. When you're bipolar, then I mean you're polar. <laughs> exactly. It works for me. If you don't, you like what she said, write it down. If you don't, then don't. Well, I think that's pretty good. All right, polar covalent. This is the opposite of nonpolar covalent. Now. If you are polar covalent, you have an electronegativity difference between 0.5 and 1.6. So your difference will be between 0.5 and 1.6. Your difference in electronegativity will be that if you are polar covalent. Any greater than 1.6, you're considered to be ionic. Pretty neat, huh? Okay, so now, if you are polar covalent, there is an unequal sharing of electrons, which means one of the atoms has the electrons more of the time. Now, there's degrees of that, which we aren't going to go into in this class, but just keep in mind, 0.5 to 1.6 polar covalent. So let's look at... Oxygen and our friend hydrogen. Why not, right? Oxygen versus hydrogen. Oxygen's electronegativity, I believe, is 3.5. Hydrogen's, I believe, is 2.1. It could be 2.4, but I think it's 2.1. So we look, we look up in the table. Now, I have these kind of minute memory. You can look them up in your table. It'll be on your exam. It's the one from your book. Don't worry about memorizing them. 3.5 is oxygen, 2.1 is hydrogen. So 3.5 minus 2.1 is 1.4. So the difference in electronegativity is 1.4. So that bond, I would call it very full. Right? Everybody? So that means one of those atoms will be delta positive, one will be delta negative. Which one's which? Well, Exactly. The oxygen will be delta positive or negative? Delta, delta negative. negative. Because it's got the higher electronegativity, it's better at stealing electron density. <coughs> Make sense? Yes. Everybody? So this will be delta minus. And the hydrogen will be delta plus. Remember, the deltas mean it's slightly negative. It's not a true negative charge. It's not ionic, in other words. It's slightly negative. The delta positive means it's slightly positive. Or in other words, it's not a pure, true positive. It's only a fraction of a positive charge. It's a smaller, smaller amount than a positive charge. Is that okay? It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward to calculate this stuff, right? Yes. Okay. Polar covalent. Now, anything above that, 1.6, is considered to be ionic. So 1.6, well they say here 1.8, I'll never give you anything that's close to the border, don't worry about it, is considered ionic. So here I guess it's 1.8, not 1.6, but I, I never give ones that are close to the borders. So they're always in the middle. Makes it more obvious, right? If you're greater than 1. Point, I say 6, the book says 1.8, you are ionic. So sodium and chlorine are ionic, potassium and chlorine are ionic, basically metal, non-metal. Those are ionic. 
That's the easy way to figure it out. All right? Well, that's pretty neat, right? I think that's pretty neat anyway. And ionic bonds are always polar. They have to be by definition. Neato, huh? I like it anyway. Yeah. That means you just would write the plus and minus of the delta. No deltas. Plus and minus is exactly. Because this is a flat out theft of electrons, the other one's a sharing of electrons. Mm -hmm. Or attempted theft. At least that's how I look at it anyway. Well, that's pretty neat. At least I hope you think so. And you said they're always polar? Ionic bonds are always polar, by definition. Because it's a positive and a negative being attracted to one another. So there has to be a, a plus side and a minus side. Nonpolar versus polar versus ionic bonds. Pretty neat. Okay, so far so good, right guys? Everybody pretty okay with this? March break starts in about an hour. Spring break, sorry. Shapes and polarities. So write this, write that title down in your book. Shapes and polarity. So far in this class, we've discussed molecules and we've thought of them as being flat. Flat little things that don't have anything interesting to tell us. That's not reality. Molecules are not flat. How can we remember that molecules are not flat? It's easy. You are not flat. Nothing, well, some things are flat. Most things in this world are not flat. We have three-dimensional structure because the molecules that make us have three-dimensional structure. Make sense? If the molecules were flat, we would be flat. We would be molecule thin. Or maybe just layers of molecules one or the other. So this chapter, or this part of this chapter, is going to talk about the shapes of molecules. Please write this down. Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Vesper. The Vesper theory is a big acronym for something that's relatively simple. Now, it seems like a lot, it is kind of a lot of big words. You know, valence shell, electron, repulsion theory. Wow. Whew. That's a lot. Let me ask you a question. What's a valence shell? Like you put two A, A, two. Outer, simple definition. You're saying it, just go so <laughs> like I'm five years old, you know. Don't, it's a what? Yeah. Yeah. The outermost yeah. shell that's filling with electrons. That's what you're getting at. So now, we know what the valence shell is, right? What's an electron pair? A lone pair. A lone pair. And? What? They share. They share? What else is an electron pair? It's a lone pair and a? Bond. Bond. Exactly. Bonds are made of two electrons, right? Lone pairs are made of two electrons, so both of them are considered electron pairs. Make sense? Yes. Valence shell, so outermost shell, electron pairs, so the, so the electrons that are in the outermost shell, what does it mean to repulse something? Reject it. Push it away, basically. Reject it, push it away. Right? So, outermost shell electron pairs, or the outermost shell bonds and lone pairs, repulsion, pushing away, theory. Theory is an idea. Make sense? So you know what that means, right? So we're talking about the electrons that are in the valence shell that are paired up, that are pushing against each other to make shapes. That's what that means. So now, this theory will tell us, if we use it correctly, what the overall shape of a molecule is, just by looking at the pairs of electrons. And it's really, really simple. Now, if we have a molecule such as that, we look at that and we say, okay, how many electron pairs does that carbon in the middle have? Four. That's four electron pairs. How many electron pairs does this molecule have? Four. Exactly, they have four. How many does this molecule have? Oh, let's drop this way. Four. four. 
They all have four. They all have four. Four what? Electron pairs. One has two bonds, two lone pairs. One has three bonds, one lone pair, and one has four bonds. They all have four electron pairs. But all three of those molecules have different molecular geometries. Now you say, how can that be? And it's very simple. In terms of the atoms and where they're placed, we only worry about the atoms. They're going to have different shapes. In terms of the electron pairs, they all have the same shape. It's a little bit confusing, I know. But when you're looking at molecular shape, only consider the atoms. So the atoms are going to be in this shape. The electrons will be in a different shape altogether. Okay? And that'll be a little bit clearer, I think, when we do some examples. So here, I'll go through that one. That's boring. Don't, don't worry about those. Whose slides are these? There we go. These aren't my slides. Sorry. I usually have my edited slides up here. Pardon me. Okay. Methane, CH4. There's four electron pairs. And there's four bonds. So there's four single bonds around the central atom. Every time you have four central, uh, four different bonds, four single bonds, every time you have four single bonds, you form what is called a tetrahedral. Every time you have four single bonds around a central atom, you form what is called a tetrahedral. Now a tetrahedral, if you want to think of it as something that we're all familiar with, think of a tripod with a camera on top. It's more or less a tetrahedral. It has three legs and a top. Or if you want, think of a pyramid. It has three, three, ba uh, three corners at the base and one peak at the top. That's a tetrahedral. So the atoms, the hydrogens will be at the top, and at the legs of the pyramid, and the carbon would be somewhere in the center of the pyramid. Okay? That's called tetrahedral. It's just a geometric shape. So far, so good? Does that make a little bit of sense? And we represent that. You want to look at the, the model on the screen there. I don't want to, if I draw it, it'll probably be messy. So there's a tetrahedral shape. The three little white balls at the bottom, those could be considered the base of the pyramid or the tripod. And the top white ball, the one pointing up, that can be considered the camera at the top of the tripod or the top of the pyramid. Make sense? Everybody like that? Yeah. Good. Well, there we go. A little bit of excitement there. Now, remember, the little lines that hold those hydrogens to the carbon are just electrons sitting inside there somewhere. So they're going to push back against each other. They're going to be like, get out of here. I don't want you here. Get out of here. I don't want you here. Now, they adopt an angle between each other of 109. So the angle between all of the hydrogens in that molecule is 109 degrees. Why? Because that's the ideal angle. It puts them as far away from all the other hydrogens as possible. Because they want to get away from those electron pairs because they repel each other. Make sense? Yeah. So um, with the tetral, is it always going to be uh, 109 or just with this example? Tetrahedrals are always 109. Okay. I mean, within 0.5 degrees. Okay. Good question. So how do we know it's going to be a tetrahedral? Four single bonds to a central atom. That's it. That's all you got to do is look for the four single bonds to a central atom. Bam, tetrahedral. Now the next one. Now we have something a little bit different. We have three single bonds. And one, I'll leave right underneath, plus one lone pair. Three single bonds plus one lone pair. So what does that mean? Well, that's going to give us a shape that looks kind of like this one. Kind of neat, huh? Kind of looks a little bit different. It's missing that top hydrogen to make the tetrahedral. This is called trigonal pyramidal or pyramidal. That shape is very, very uh, nice. I think it's basically a tripod without the camera on top. That's how I think of it. Where the base of the tripod or where the camera would sit. We have a tripod right here, don't we? Hello, TV lad. This is an extreme close-up here. 
So this will be the nitrogen, the base of the tripod, and these would be the hydrogens coming down here. Visual aid. Never had a visual aid for this before, so I'm kind of happy about this. <laughs> <laughs> so freaky. <laughs> right? I hate cameras. Anyway, so does everyone kind of get the idea, the shape? Think of this base right here as the nitrogen, and these legs are the hydrogens. That's a trigonal uh, pyramidal. Okay. All right. So, and then how do we know which? Uh, how do we know it's trigonal pyramidal? One lone pair, three single bonds. Easy peasy. So this is trigonal pyramidal. Spell it correctly here. Trigonal pyramidal. Now, oops. Oh, no, sorry. That's the problem. I D A L. That makes more sense. Here my dial. Now the next one, water. We have two single bonds. We get the blue egg out here. Two single bonds plus two lone pairs. Now two single bonds plus two lone pairs. That's going to adopt a different geometric shape. Now it's kind of interesting so far, right? So far we have tetrahedral, you know, kind of an interesting word we don't use every day. Then we go to trigonal pyramidal, and that's like, wow, that's even more complicated. Two kind of words we don't use every day. So this one must be even more complicated, right? Must be like some crazy words that no one's ever heard of, right? This is called... <laughs> bent. And I'm not kidding, that's what it's called. Bent. So we go from tetrahedral, which makes you sound really smart when you say it, trigonal pyramidal, which makes people think you're just a genius, and then you say, bent. <laughs> and that's what it's called. That's what it's written out in, in the professional journals. That is what it's called. It's bent. It's a bent molecule. How does that look? It looks bent. There's no other way to describe it. Think of a pipe, bend it at a degree, uh, kind of a 90 degree angle or a little bit less. That's water. It's bent. And it's represented usually like this. Not quite a 90 degree angle. It's actually 109 degrees, to be honest with you. So now, it's bent. So the hydrogens go like this, so oxygen, and then back down, it's bent. Mm -hmm. I wish there was a nicer, bigger, more interesting word to put there, but there's not. It's bent. Okay. So far, so good. Now, there's more in your book. They talk about more different kinds of uh, uh, shapes. The only other one that you really need to know about is called linear. It's a straight line. So when you have just two atoms attached to each other, for example, H and Cl, but it's just two atoms attached to each other, and there's no other atoms. Oh, well, there's a few examples where there are, and I'll show you them in a minute. Those are called linear. So one single bond is linear. Yep. The other example that I want you to know about is carbon dioxide. It's drawn like that. That's carbon dioxide right there on the right. That's what it looks like. It's linear as well. So just please write that down. That's the only other linear compound I want you to know. Carbon dioxide is also linear. And so is carbon monoxide, by the way. They are linear in shape. Okay? All right. So, so far, so good. Now, there's other shapes in your book. There's like... I don't know, there's two or three other ones that you don't have to know. These are the three big ones and linear, you have to know that, please. All right. Now on an exam, I may ask you to tell me the molecular shape of an atom. I just might, or a molecule, excuse me. I just might. And it's important to know how to predict shape when looking at things like uh, polarity and stuff like that. Now, if we had a molecule H2S, I would probably just draw the molecule on the board for you. H2S has this kind of shape. H, S, H, lone pair here, lone pair there. So now, looking at that molecule, we say, okay, is that molecule tetrahedral, trigonal, bent, or linear? You look at the central atom, which is sulfur. You're looking at the sulfur now. It has two single electro, uh, two single bonds and two lone pairs. Is that correct? Yeah. So it, its molecular geometry or its shape must be? It must be bent, very similar to water. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. It's pretty simple, right? It's really not uh, that challenging for you guys because you guys are pretty bright. But it's something that we just have to go over because it's important to know for other parts of this course. Now let's say we had this. CCl4, carbon tetrachloride. That is a carbon with four chlorines attached to it. So there's a carbon central atom with four single bonds. What must the molecular geometry be? Tetrahedral, right? Four single bonds, tetrahedral. Pretty straightforward? Everyone, everyone okay with it? Yes. All right, very nice. Now, let's move on to uh, molecules. Yeah, go ahead. It's not determinative. Um, you said with water, yes. water is bent. Yes. Is that why if you put water in a cup and you put something in like a marker, it'll bend? Uh, no, that's not why that happens. Okay. It's because of the magnification properties of water. Well, that's a great, great observation. That's a physics question, which kind of scares me. <laughs> <laughs> but you should talk to our resident physics professor, Dr. Galea. He'd be happy to explain that to you. It's, it's, I think Galea is called, uh, it's called refraction, I believe it's called. Oh, yeah. So just describe what you told, just told me, and he would explain it to you, and he'd probably draw crap and make you feel really smart when you're done. <laughs> I know when I talk, I feel really smart. Oh, wow. Huh? Now I know things. <laughs> But yeah, definitely, if you're interested in physics, I would definitely take, take Dr. Belia for a physics course here for our He's very good. Nice, yeah. nice human being. All right, nonpolar molecules. Now, we talked about polar and nonpolar bonds. Now I'm going to blow your mind. You can have polar bonds, but your molecule itself will be nonpolar. Whoa! That's when everyone's like, no, no, come on now. <laughs> Spring break is like an hour away. <laughs> Stop. Well, I'll keep you over time today. Everyone's like, really? Yeah, you think I'm going to be real? Yeah, right. All right, let's take a look at carbon dioxide. Now, I just got through telling you carbon dioxide was linear. So carbon dioxide is linear. We can calculate the polarity of each bond. It doesn't matter that they're double bonds. That's not irrelevant. We can calculate the polarity of the bonds. We know that oxygen is 3.5. Carbon is 2.4, I believe. So the difference is about 1.1, right? So the difference, the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and carbon is about 1.1. Is everyone kind of feeling me there? Mm -hmm. So those bonds should be polar. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You Right now, you guys would say, those bonds are polar. That molecule, therefore, must be polar. That's right now. Now I'm going to tell you something else. How about you two ladies come up to the front, please? You don't have to, but it'd be nice if you did. Some encouragement for these ladies, everybody. See, the whole world loves you guys. See? Now, I brought these two young ladies up here because they look about the same strength. They're both going to play oxygen. Is that okay? I will play the role of carbon. Please do not hurt me. Okay. If you do, it's okay. Now. Hold on one second. They're oxygen, both of them. They're 3.5. So they're equal in strength. Okay? They're equal at stealing electrons. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm carbon. I'm 2.5. Everyone with me? Okay. We're going to make a bond. I'm going to bond one oxygen and the other in a linear fashion. So just hold my hand like this. Get my, get my, oh, here, put your other hand. There we go. So now we have a bond here, and we do the same thing with the bond there. Now, Go ahead and we'll stretch it a little bit. There we go. So we're all nice crap. Now, this is called kill the professor. Now, <laughs> they're both equal in strength. So she's going to pull that way. She's like, ha-ha, I've got electrons. But she's like, not so fast. I want electrons too. So she pulls that way. Now, they're both the same strength. So they're both pulling evenly left to right. Is that true? Yeah. So now I have electrons in my center, my core. They're trying to pull my core electrons that way, and she's trying to pull them that way. They don't go anywhere, do they? Because she's pulling with equal strength as her, my electrons are like, whatever, I'll just sit right here. <laughs> Make sense? Mm -hmm. So even though these two people here, these two ladies, are electronegative, more electronegative than me, they're very good at stealing electrons, 
they end up pulling equally in both directions, therefore the electrons don't move either side. Does that make sense? Yeah. Everybody like that? Mm -hmm. Okay, don't go away ladies, don't go away. Don't go away. So that molecule will be non-polar. Even though the bonds you predict will be polar, because of the shape of the molecule, it's non-polar. Because they're pulling that way, and they're pulling that way, the same amount. Does that make sense? Can I repeat that? They're both oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. So they're both pulling my electrons, my arms, basically, equally that way and that way. So my electrons that are in my core are feeling the effects to go that way, and go that way the same. So if someone's pulling you to the left and to the right with the same energy, your actual body won't move. So think of your body as the electrons. Your electrons stay dead center in the, in the middle, therefore there's no polarity. There's no delta negative, there's no delta positive. Okay. Got it? Mm -hmm. Makes sense? And okay, cool. Only one of them you Aha! Well, let's do it. Don't go away. Okay. She and I are bonded together. Okay? She's like, I'm hydrogen, she's like chlorine. She's like, hook, draws my electron right to her core. So my core is like, hey, 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 what's She's slightly negative. She's very, yeah, slightly negative, I'm slightly positive. I'm delta positive, she's delta negative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, now, let's mix it up a little bit. I'm gonna be oxygen, and they're gonna be hydrogen. Okay, don't go away. Let me draw this on the board. Don't go away, here we go, where's my marker Okay, I will be oxygen, they will be hydrogen. So oxygen is bent, yeah? Or sorry, water, excuse me, is bent. Is that true? Yes. All right, they're hydrogen now. So I'm gonna be the oxygen molecule, and they're going to be, the heat this is gonna right here. <coughs> right, let's bond up, same as before. So they're hydrogen, I'm oxygen, I'm very electromagnetic, so I'm pulling their electrons towards me now, right? Okay, so now this young lady is delta positive, this young lady is delta positive, and I am delta negative. So we're polar. Why? Because I'm drawing electron density to this side of the molecule, so I'm on one side of the molecule, right? And they're on the other side, right? Does that make sense? Their side of the molecule is different than my side, right? I'm delta negative, they're delta positive. Make sense? So if you're best, you can as long as your bonds are polar, right, as long as your bonds are polar, you will be polar. If your bonds aren't polar, you won't be. Okay? Does that make sense, everybody? So these guys are hydrogen, I'm pulling their electrons, they're getting coming slightly positive. Everybody like that? Everyone, give a round of applause for my people on here. You're doing a great job. Thank you guys very much. Okay, probably should better from the camera, though. <laughs> I'm not an actor. Nor am I a producer. Okay. So now, how do we do this? Now, on an exam, obviously, you can't have people come to the front and, and pull each other's arms off. So how do we do it on an exam? Well, we use these things called dipole arrows, or polarity arrows. Polarity arrows look like this. They have a little uh, T at the end. The delta negative is here. The delta positive is on that side of the arrow. How do you remember that? That kind of resembles a plus charge, right? So the delta positive goes on that side. The delta negative comes on this side. Make sense? So what that arrow is going to show you is what direction the bond is polarized. Okay? So now, 3.5 and 2.1. So that bond is polarized in that direction. If it was just that carbon-oxygen bond, it will be polarized to the right. The delta negative would be here, the delta positive would be here. We have two oxygens like that. Okay, so one polarity arrow points that way, the other one points this way. Don't worry that they're different lengths, that's just my, my bad drawing. So now look at the polarity arrows. They're both pulling in exactly the opposite direction. Does that make sense? Because they're pulling in the exact opposite direction, that molecule is nonpolar. Basically, they're pulling my arms equally left to right. Does that make some sense? So that molecule has to be nonpolar. Is that okay? What about water? Hydrogen is 
I don't know, I think it's 2.4, I'm not even sure. And hydrogen oxygen 3.5, so that's a pretty big difference. So now, we know that this bond is polar, because we've drawn it. We've calculated the electronegativity difference, it's greater than 0.5, less than 1.8. So we know electron density is being drawn that way. So the bonds, the electrons in the bond, are being pulled towards the oxygen. Now the polarity arrows here are both pointing in the same direction, relatively. You know, they're both pointing kind of at the oxygen, right? Does everyone like that? So this molecule would be polar. There would be a big delta negative here, and delta positives here and here. Okay? So those hydrogens become delta plus, the oxygen becomes delta negative. Everybody like that? If they point uh, anywhere but directly opposite, basically. As long as they're not pointing directly opposite of each other or directly towards each other, they're polar. So the, the um, electronegativity, the higher it is, that's where you're going to go? Yep. The higher the, the, the element with the larger electronegativity pulls electrons to itself. So it becomes slightly negative. Very good question. All right. So this molecule is polar. Is that reasonable? Now I know everyone in this room is saying, why is this important? You are saying that, right? Yes. Good. That's good that you're being inquisitive. It's important for, uh, well, a few reasons. Let me get to it. There we go. Write this down. This is actually extraordinarily important. I cannot underestimate how important this is. You will use this in anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, uh, chemistry, it's a very important concept. Attractive forces in compounds. Go for it. And you said the larger number opposes the electronegativity that would be the delta negative? Yes, yes. The larger the delta the electronegativity, uh, they will get the delta negatives because they are the stronger ones in, in stealing electrons. Attractive forces. Now, Go for it. Would it, would it ever be two, um, two negative delta? Would it ever be two? Uh, what do you mean? Like, oh, I see. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I probably won't show you that in this course. Those are, those are odd. Mm -hmm. They exist, but they're odd. Things like, uh, I believe, Tatuan does that. Okay. Now, have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered, because all of you guys know this, right? You guys all know that, like, things like uh, butane. You've all seen butane lighters, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone in this room has seen butane before. And you guys all know water, right? Everyone in this room has seen water before. Mm -hmm. Butane, butane lighters, it's a liquid. But butane is very volatile, right? You break open the lighter, the liquid spills out and evaporates very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Water, you can drop water on the floor, it won't evaporate probably for a day. Okay? Now, butane is C4... H, what is it, 8, 10. C4H10. Don't worry about the formula just now. We'll do that all in organic. But I just want you to know it's C4H10. Water is H2O. Let me just do it like this. Water H2O. Okay. Now, we haven't discussed this yet, but just kind of bear with me. Remember we talked about atomic masses on the periodic table? How every element has a different mass, like hydrogen is 1.00 whatever, carbon is 12 point whatever. All the elements have different masses. So now if we have butane, that's C4H10, that's 4 times uh, 48, 58. So it's around mass, it has a mass of about 58 units. Don't worry about the units today. We will talk about the units in chapter 5. but this, Relatively speaking, this has a mass of 58. Water has a mass of 18. So now, I'm not worried about the units or that you memorize these units or anything like that yet. All I want you to understand is that butane is heavier than water. Much heavier. Three times heavier than water. Okay? Just accept that. Butane is three times heavier than water. Okay? Now, in terms of 
boiling point. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, right? Butane boils, I believe, it's close to 20 degrees Celsius. If butane boils at very low temperature, water boils at 100 degrees. But wait a minute, butane weighs three times as much. So shouldn't butane boil at a higher temperature? No, it's heavier. If it's heavier, it should boil at a higher temperature. Yes. Yes. No, yes. because yes. if you're heavier, I, if, if I'm heavier than you, I can walk fast. You can walk faster than me. Good point. However, butane boils at 20 degrees. Gasoline, which is octane, which is three, twice as heavy as butane, boils at over 100. Uh, boils at like 80 degrees. So the heavier you are as an element or a molecule, generally you boil at a higher temperature. Generally, okay. So now water is three times lighter than butane. Boils at more than double or more than triple its boiling point. Why would that be? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Doesn't really make sense, does it? What were you going to say? They have similar shapes, believe it or not. Okay, similar shapes. The chemical, what about the chemical? It's very volatile. They are, well, butane is very volatile for sure. Water is not. Water is extremely non volatile, oh. annoyingly so. So, water is lighter and boils at a higher temperature. Go back to our definition of boiling. What does it mean to boil? Right. What's the now? That's true. It's a change of liquid to gas. Now, if you're going to boil, what's the difference between boiling and evaporating? All the molecules leave the liquid. They go directly to steam. Right, and evaporation is the same thing. Okay. What's the difference? Right. Evaporation is the surface molecules get enough energy to leave the, the liquid, whatever the liquid happens to be, okay? So now, boiling is all the molecules in the liquid have enough energy to leave as vapor. So now, butane will evaporate almost instantly. Water will evaporate over the course of about a day, right? So it takes more energy then to evaporate water. Make sense? Does everyone agree with that? If butane will evaporate like that, water will evaporate every few hours in the direct sunlight, let's say. Butane must require less energy to evaporate. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, imagine you're sitting at the surface of a water molecule and you yourself are a water molecule and you're at the surface. Why is it taking you so much energy to leave, to go as a gas? Why would it take energy? If you're at a party with your friends well, and you're having a good time, just put that caveat in there. You're having a good time. Why does it take so much energy for you to leave? Why don't you want to leave? Attracted. You're attracted to your friends, aren't you? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're attracted to your friends. So it takes more energy for you to want to go home, right? If you're a water molecule sitting at the surface, you're attracted to other water molecules at the surface, okay? That's why it takes so much energy to get that water molecule to say, I can go off as a gas now. Does that make sense? It's all about energies. Now, butane is carbon bonded to carbon bonded to hydrogen. So it's carbon and carbon bonds, carbon and hydrogen bonds, like that. Water is hydrogen to oxygen, like that. So butane contains these two kind of bonds. Oops. Butane contains a carbon-carbon bond and a carbon-hydrogen bond. The electronegativity of carbon is 2.4, I think, and hydrogen is 2.1. So these bonds are nonpolar. Does that make sense? Everybody? Carbon, 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 hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. Does that make sense? Hydrogen oxygen bonds are extremely polar, right? What does, let me say this in a certain way. Um, if you have a positive charge and a negative charge side by side, what happens? They attract. If you have two neutral things side by side, what do they do? Not much, right? They just kind of hang out. They don't attract, they don't repel, they just kind of are. Make sense? Water, as we just discussed, has a delta plus and a delta minus. Does that make sense? 
Water has a delta minus and a delta plus. So now if it's attracted to its friends, that must mean the delta positive of one water molecule and the delta negative of another interact. A little dash line there just simply means that they're attracted. It doesn't, doesn't mean they're doing anything else but attracting one another. Does that make sense? One side is delta negative, the other side is delta positive, so they are attracting one another. So this is how it really looks? Well, it's how we represent it, yeah. Okay. It's how we represent it. Inside, inside of a flask, it probably looks a lot different than what we draw, but that's, that's how we represent it. The water molecules are, each water molecule is attracted to another. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. So now, that can happen more than once. One water, remember these things are three dimensional. So one water molecule can have three or four or five other water molecules that are attracted to it. And now remember, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. You can have another water molecule here. Drive it to a different water molecule. And one over here. Strike it to that water molecule. Okay? Forms a network. So if you want to think about this, and it's kind of freaky if you just think about it for a minute. Go to the beach here in South Florida. All the water in South Florida, I mean this is really not true, but think of it like this. All the water in South Florida is connected to the water in Europe through a millions or billions of hydrogen, a little bond, a little interaction all the way across the ocean. It has to be true because the oceans will evaporate very fast. Isn't that neat? Did you ever play the game, movie game, Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon? <laughs> One person. Nobody else. Kevin Bacon is this great number. Foot loops, anybody? No. Thanks. Thanks for making me feel old before I grade your exam. <laughs> now, it's a good laugh at all. now, attractive forces, that's occurring. Now, if, has anyone here ever hung drywall before? One person, two people, three people. Anyone else? All right. When you hang drywall, you've all seen it, I'm sure. When you hang drywall, you put the two pieces of drywall side by side on the wall, right? And then you either do it yourself or you hire somebody to make it look really good, put mud in between the two pieces of drywall. That's why walls look smooth, right? Now, people, people always think you do that, put the mud there to, and the tape and all that stuff to make it look pretty. And it does make it look pretty. But it does one other thing. What does it do? It bonds two pieces of drywall together. Okay? Did you ever think about that? Your, your drywall in your house is all, all one big piece of drywall because they bond it together with mud. Why do they do that? So when your house shifts, one piece of drywall has to move all pieces of drywall to crack, basically, more or less. There's other things there too, more or less. So now, one water molecule is attached to hundreds of other water molecules. Makes that one water molecule much harder to get it to evaporate. This is attracted to so many others. Does that make sense? You don't like that one? Take a pencil and break it in two. Don't really do it. You can all break one pencil in half, right? Try breaking 30 pencils in half at the same time. You can't do it. One pencil strengthens the other. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Takes more energy to break two pencils than it does to break one. Mm -hmm. Takes more to break three than it does to break two. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So because they're all attracted to each other, that's going to increase the boiling point. All right. Everyone okay with that sort of? Okay. Sort of. Yeah, I know. It's kind of weird. But let it sink in a little bit. Trust me, it'll become clear. All right. There are three kinds of molecular interactions. One is called dispersion forces, the other is called hydrogen bonding, which is what this is. This is hydrogen bonding. I'll get back to this in a minute. Water does hydrogen bonding, we'll go back to that in a hot second. Dispersion forces are by far the most complicated to describe, so I'll do my best. And they are also the weakest one, the weakest one. Now remember we said Nonpolar molecules don't like to interact. They kind of just sit beside each other and go, eh. Not quite the truth. They do interact. They do attract each other a little bit, but it's very weak. Butane would use dispersion forces to attract other butane molecules, but it's very 
weak. Now, when we talk about dispersion forces, it's nice to talk about gases. Why? Because they're simple to talk about. Let's draw up an atom of helium. Just a straight up atom of helium. And let's draw one beside it. So these are just two helium atoms. These are helium. Helium has two electrons, yeah? One electron, two electrons. The one on the right has two electrons also. Now, let's imagine we clear the room and we go outside and we look in. So this room is clear. Just imagine there's no stools around. Just imagine it's one big room and we're looking in. And we get two toddlers, like six or seven year old, five or six year old, you know, they have all this energy, right? Just like electrons, they have all this energy. And you put them in the room. And they're, they're children, right? So they're going to run around. Now imagine that they don't want to talk to each other, and imagine that they don't want to play together, they're just going to run around the room. Because, you know, kids will play together, obviously. But imagine they just have all this energy, we gave them caffeine and Red Bull, and they're going to just run around the room for hours, okay? Don't give your kids caffeine. Now, I never said this, so don't. Now, they're running around the room with electrons, right? So there's two of them, so they're just kind of whipping around here, right? They're just going everywhere, here, there, everywhere. No really order to it, they're just randomly sprinting around the room. Okay, imagine this room is the atom, and imagine those children are the electrons. Here I am standing basically in the center of the room. So the, the room is divided, left side, right, or right side to you, left side to you. So the room is divided. At any given time, those kids could be anywhere in the room. So we take a snapshot and we say, okay, there's one kid here, one kid here. So both sides of the room have a negative charge, right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. Kids are on both sides of the room. At any given time though, those two kids could be over here, right? Does it make sense then? Those two kids are on this side of the room. This side of the room becomes negative, right? Because both negative charges are now here. This side of the room, because the kids are over there, is positive. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, they're electrons, so wham, they come back, they start moving, it's a snapshot in time. They never stop moving, it's a snapshot in time. They were here, and now they're not. Now they're somewhere else, right? They're children, so you never know where they're gonna be. Now, in the helium atom, the electrons can do that. They can be, at any given second, they can be over here, both of them, or they can be randomly dispersed, or they can be over here. Now there's only two children or two electrons in this room, so the odds of having both of them on the same side at the same time is relatively small. Does that make sense? Because, you know, this is odds, right? Monte Carlo odds or casino odds? So now, in the helium atom, the two little elements or electrons are zipping around the atom. And at any given time, they might be over here. So let's just say, at this brief instance of time, the electrons are both on the left. So for this brief little second, this side becomes delta negative, that side becomes delta positive of the atom. Okay, the helium atom, for that fleeting moment, becomes delta positive, delta negative. That means that this element beside it will become Delta negative. <laughs> I thought it was someone moaning. <laughs> Everybody all right? Wow, that's pretty crazy. Okay, at a brief moment in time, this becomes delta negative, delta positive. That will induce this one to become delta negative and delta positive because the electrons get drawn over because of that one. Now remember, this is gases, so these atoms are zipping by each other really fast. So these are fleeting. They don't happen very often. Okay? So far, so good. We make a little bit of sense? Now, let's imagine where we replace this room with, instead of two children, we put in 54. That would be xenon. So now we have 54 kids, all hopped up on sugar and caffeine, running around inside of this room. All right. We come to the center of the room. There's 54 children. They're sitting around having a good old time. There's 54 of them now. So the odds of having 
uh, one extra electron on one side of the room becomes much greater. Does that make sense? Because there's simply more of them. So at any given time, there could be half plus one over here. Does that make sense? So if, there, if there's half the kids plus one extra on one side of the room, that side of the room becomes delta negative. Yes? And the other side becomes delta positive. Is that okay? So if that's true, if that's true, then xenon should follow the same pattern. It should be more likely then that things like xenon can, can have delta positives and delta negatives because there's simply more electrons. Right? Does that make a little bit of sense? Xenon has 54, helium has 2. So that means that xenon should be able to set up a delta positive, delta negative interaction more often. Is that true? So that, if xenon can do that, that means it should boil at a much higher temperature. Just like water, right? Does that make sense? Kind of? A little bit? Xenon boils at negative 150 or something like that. Helium boils at negative 270. Helium boils close to absolute zero. Xenon boils much higher than that. They're both pretty bloody cold, but Xenon's not as cold. Okay? Because it can do this little setup more often. Okay? It's all very abstract, I know. But try to get your mind wrapped around it a little bit. It's not that difficult, but you have to let your mind think about it just a little. Because it is a little bit abstract. Kind of fun, huh? Kids and electrons zipping around a room, hopped up on caffeine. Who wouldn't like that? All right, let's get to the main one here. Whoops, where'd it go? I'll finish it off on the board then. Let's talk real quick about hydrogen bonding, a little bit more in depth. H bonding or hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. Now. You must have either an NH or OH. You must have one of those. There is a HF will do it too, but we don't, I don't worry much about that. You must have that bond. You either have to have an OH or an NH. If you don't have either one of those, you don't have hydrogen bonding. If you have either one of those, you probably most likely do have hydrogen bonding. This will be delta negative, there's electronegativity. This will be delta positive, delta negative, delta positive. Now, because of that dipole, delta negative, delta positive, these things can do what's called hydrogen bonding. And I already showed it to you, but let me show it to you one more time, just so you have a nice little setup in your notes. When the delta positive of the hydrogens from one oxygen are attracted to the delta negative of the oxygen on another. Or it could be nitrogen. Delta negative, delta positive, delta positive. This interaction right there is called a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond. That interaction right there is a hydrogen bond. Now, it is not an actual covalent bond. It's a very unfortunate name, I think, because it's really not a covalent bond. It is simply an attractive force. They're just going to be drawn together because one is positive, or delta positive, excuse me, and one is delta negative. They're just going to be drawn or attracted to one another. And that's the end of it. Okay? They're, they're not really covalent bonding. Not really. Now, when we get to the chapter on acids and bases, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But for now, just understand that a hydrogen bond, you must have an NH or an OH, and the hydrogen bond is the attractive force between the delta positive of the hydrogen and the delta negative of the oxygen or nitrogen. Okay? One whole week off.